Heather Stratford. Uh, Heather Stratford is no stranger to the Lockdown Conference. We were fortunate enough to have her last year as one of our keynote speakers, and she's back again this year, so we're really uh, especially excited about that. Heather is the founder and CEO of Stronger International Incorporated. Her experience ranges from technology startups to legacy industries like construction and traditional publishing. But having launched two international companies of her own, Moxie Marketing and Stronger International, she now specializes in startups and young organizations. Heather has an MBA in International Management from the Thunderbird School of Global Management and a BA in Communications and International Relations from Brigham Young University. Please join me in a warm welcome to Heather Stratford. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right. The toughest spot is right after lunch. All of you are going to try and go to sleep on me, and it is my job to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, it's a really important topic and one that I speak on quite a bit. But let me just tell you a little bit about myself, because one of the things that's hard when you come to a big conference is you're kind of detached, right? You can sit there and check your phone and, and not interact very well. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I, um, I have five children. I have been to 35 countries. I love making crepes for breakfast. And I am a pretty decent mountain biker and can go down some black diamond trails um, like nobody's business. So that is, that's a little bit about who I am. So today we're going to talk about the cyber tsunami. And I like that word because it's not overly used in the media today but it really brings out this idea of a huge wave coming towards us. And we're in the industry. We know it's coming. And oftentimes, we're almost like the, the, the bell ringer. The wave is coming. The wave is coming. And we're trying to let other people realize what's really coming our direction before it pummels the beach and, and, and takes out the pier and everything else. And so, this is a very accurate word for where we are right now. So I'll just keep talking. The cyber tsunami is, is the topic. And we're all those bell ringers. But there are several things that are coming our direction. We're in an industry that's, that's changing rapidly. So 20 years ago, you didn't have data protection officers. You didn't have cybersecurity or CISOs. I mean, that, that wasn't in the lexicon. It just wasn't there. And so things have shifted, but it, they're continuing to shift. And so my talk today is on all those different things that are on the horizon. Sometimes you get involved in, in your daily job and you're busy. You're putting out fires. You're head down looking at what you have to look at. And it's rare that you lift your head, you look around and say, oh my gosh, things are really changing. So this is to have you think about what's on the forefront of our industry. What is changing things now um, and what's stayed the same? All right, perfect. Thank you for your help. Okay, so um, I love this image. I think all of us can relate to this because you look at it and you say, oh yeah, head in the sand. How many of you have some stakeholder that's in either your department or above you that this represents? Come on, hands up. Do you have anybody in your organization that says, oh, well, that's not a problem. Well, we didn't have to deal with that five years ago. Well, why do we need budget for this now? What do you mean it's a regulation? I've never heard of the regulation, right? How many of us have this? Yeah? OK, so that's the one thing we have in common, right? And because our industry is changing so rapidly, this is, this is inevitable, right? Our job is to help explain, this is why, this is what I need, and this is how it's going to help the organization. Whether that organization is a large university, like the University of Wisconsin-Madison, 
whether it's a small company that's privately owned or whether it's government. Everybody needs to know why is it important. So the data breach statistics. I took this about six weeks ago. Uh, the numbers are perpetually changing. But the main thing is, since 2013, the number of stolen records increases, 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 right? This is not new to us. But it's great for you to be able to tell those stakeholders, hey, every day, every day, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of zeros there. I put my glasses on. I'm starting, I just got these like three months ago and I'm still getting used to it. Okay, every second, 58 records are sold every second. That didn't happen 20 years ago. Why? We had our own little network. We weren't connected in. We didn't have cloud, right? We didn't have all these, these other things that are evolving. So there's the problem, right? So how are we solving that? OK, current trends. We're going to go over all these areas. Increased costs, IoT attacks, uh, which we had a great presentation on this morning. Healthcare as a tar targeted vertical, and why healthcare? The shift to crypto mining, and what that shift of, of cryptocurrency is doing. Uh, that also involves some blockchain, right? And then more regulations. And what that regulation environment means and how it's changing. So the current trends, Let's talk about increased costs. OK, so how many of you have an increased budget from three years ago in either IT or in security? Increased. Do you have an increased budget? OK, so the, the average is somewhere between 15 and 20% increase. But that takes into account all of the smaller companies, uh, enterprise, right? But there's more people. There's more things. Um, this is a specific instance which I, I like to look at because it has so many different characteristics of what is common nowadays. First of all, how many of you are familiar with Faraj Jha? He is the one. OK, I see one person back there that's really brave. Nobody else? The Rutgers? OK. All right, so this is two people, two people. All right. So he, uh, he was a student, a very bright student, who got into the system and said, well, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? Okay. He still lives at home. He uh, decided to create some malware. And he decided that one of the targets would end up being the university which he went to. You know, it's back in the day where you were a, uh, a high school student. You wanted to change your grade from a C to to an A, right? OK, so it's hacking the system. So he went beyond that um, and actually shut down the Rutgers system it, uh, and slowed it down. And he targeted it at a very specific time so that it would make the most disruption for faculty, staff, and students signing up. Okay. They estimate that the cost was between, and I think this is a huge range. I mean, I think lawyers got a hold of this, so I have no idea. But somewhere between 3.5 and 9.5 million dollars was estimated as the damage that they incurred. Now he pleaded guilty in a Trenton courthouse um, to this offense. What's sad is they can't pin all the other things that he did on him because he gave his secret sauce to other hackers. And they went along and helped, and, and the virus of 2016 is attributed to him. Now, what do we learn from this? This is something that's going to happen more and more. First of all, now he wasn't faculty and staff, but it was an insider threat, right? It wasn't somebody completely unfamiliar with the system. Another thing is that it, it uh, took a while, but finally went through that legal system. How much did it cost the university? A lot of money. Now, 
in response to this, they have put three million in the past two years, and that, that, that statistic's about a year old, into upgrading, teaching, training, et cetera, to catch up. So this is a trend. Increased costs, both on how much is in your budget, how many people you have to fight it, but also it crosses that legal side, right? And when you cross that legal side and you start racking up, then, then you, the, all the costs are increasing. Okay, let's talk about IoT attacks. So we had a great presentation this morning, and I wanted to go into just this one a couple specific examples. So medical is a specific example of where IoT becomes very scary. And the reason that we know about a lot of this is because the media picks up on it, right? When you start saying that you've got baby monitors and heart uh, defibrillators and, and different things that are, are pacemakers that are very uh, tied into a person's life or death situation, then all of a sudden you have a, a headline. Um, it, it's sensationalized. Does it mean that it's the only place it's happening? Of course not. So um, they say that uh, um, 8.4 billion connected devices were cataloged last year. So 8.4. So what's the guess for 2020? That's a year and a half away. How many connected devices on IoT are estimated? Anybody better going to be brave? Say it, say it louder. Yep, yep. So it's between 20 and 21 billion devices. Look at that exponential growth. We're talking about trends. So when we had that presentation this morning that said, scan your university, scan your, your company, figure out what IoT devices you have, this is the trend. You cannot put your head in the sand on IoT. So let's look at what this particular attack was. Uh, the recall was for 465,000 pacemakers. And pacemakers, right? Life or death. Making sure that heart beats. There's a reason that they disconnected former uh, Vice President Dick Cheney's uh, pacemaker because they were concerned about that as a hacking potential, okay? Um, so St. Jude's uh, Medical was the original producers of the devices, and they were later bought out by Abbott uh, pacemakers. I'm not sure Abbott really knew what they were getting, but they got it anyways. And um, this shows us another trend. As companies gobble up other companies, what happens? You get their staff, you get their IP. What do you also get? You get their risk, and you get their policies and what they've done, right? So right here, Abbott Pacemakers inherited a huge mess. Do you know the most recent patch to these pacemakers was in April of 2018, okay? So it's a continuing risk, and it's a continuing problem. Talk about their bad press and publicity. This was huge, right? They bought something they thought, and, and it, uh, it kind of unraveled in the, in the media on this. Okay, so what did we learn from the, this IoT attack? Medical is a huge vector that is being attacked. It is sensationalized in the media, and yet it is a place where uh, they're, they're patching. The other thing is uh, St. Jude's continued to send out the defective devices after it was identified, okay? Because they had an inventory. It was a dollars and cents move, right? They had a, an inventory of product that they didn't just throw away, they continued to send out. So, okay, IoT attacks. This one I think is great, because it's kind of fun. Okay, have you heard about this one? A, a, a Dark Trace uh, CIO talked about this in one of, one of her uh, talks. Uh, the internet-connected thermostat 
in the lobby aquarium of a large casino. Who's heard of this one? Okay, I think it's great because I can just see the little fish swimming around and, and nobody's thinking about it. But how is Target hacked? Through the HVAC system, right? How, how is this casino hacked? And it is an unidentified casino. Uh, how were they hacked? Through the thermostat, right? An IoT device. It can be anywhere. It's through the thermostat. Now, what did they get? They uh, pulled the access of the high roller database with all personal information. And they pulled it back through all the way out. So what do we learn? Uh, use good security products. Identify even what IoT you have because it is the trend of the future. This talk is about the cyber tsunami, right? It's a tsunami. It's coming. What is part of that wave? IoT, OK? Internet of Things is part of that wave. And educate your staff, right? What's our first picture? the guy with the head in the sand, you cannot keep your head in the sand. 20 to 21 billion devices within the next 18 months, right? That's a lot of devices. All right, so what's our next? Legacy of gadgets. So um, the problem is we have a lot of gadgets that are already out there, right? It might be OK that we're continuing to think about, well, how do we make this safer from this point on? But how many things are already in the system? How many things are already on the shelf? How many things are already in your, in your closets and in, in, in the warehouse? They're already created. That's a problem. So there's a legacy of these gadgets create a lot of vectors that can be attacked. Um, I have a, uh, an associate, a friend, who is the uh, founder of uh, Bug Crowd. Yeah, who here has heard of Bug Crowd? All right, a couple people, a couple people. So I love it because uh, we are both um, female entrepreneurs in a very um, uh, ever-changing environment. And she had the great idea of saying, hey, if you've got the devices, let's have white hacking, white hat hacking, and uh, figure out where those bugs are. So there's a whole evolution of people, high schoolers, uh, college kids, they'll say, hey, I'll try and hack that device. And they go in, and they, if they find something, they get rewarded, right? And so they have a whole system set up. Now, how does, this, um, how does this sit with you if you are, let's say, a baby boomer? What do you see as a flaw of this? Do you see any flaws? You're purposely having people try and hack your, your, your product? OK, I see some laughs. What's the problem with this? Is there any? Okay. Yes, so that's the whole point. So it's like a marriage. They say, we really want to make sure we're safe, and they're actually hiring people to, to do this. It's the new wave. We're talking about the wave of the future, right? The wave is, if you have a small company, and let's say, I don't know, you have a pacemaker, you might have a staff of 10 people. Maybe your IT team is 20 people but you only have 20 minds. What happens if you could get 100 minds? And they were all thinking about security. How valuable is that? That's very valuable. And so crowdsourcing of IoT devices is the wave of the future. And uh, they are not the only ones doing this. Uh, there are other uh, crowdsourcing that is out there. I think they do it well and are continuing to move forward. So if you haven't learned about uh, crowdsourcing hacking, go search it. This is the way that you, we are going to safeguard what we have. 
Okay, new, new malware. Um, so malware is not decreasing at all, but it is evolving, right? So in the old days, we might have had the I love you virus that came through. Who remembers the I love you virus? All right, uh, okay. Um, we had uh, people attacking certain, certain things. We, we look at malware and um, there was a 42% decrease in malware when ransom, as ransom, ransomware took over, right? It is, a, it is a part of the malware spectrum. Um, it's funny, I, I have a presentation where you look at malware and you have a couple of uh, malware that has come out and then it exploded in 2015, 16, and 17. Why? Why did it explode? What's behind the malware? Who is behind the malware? That's a better word. Who? Who is behind it? Be brave, come on, who's behind it? Organized crime. crime, okay. Bad actors, organized crime, however you want to verbalize it, there are, it's the good guy, bad guy mentality. Organized crime is trying to get money and they're doing it the easiest way possible. If the malware works, they'll get it that way. Phishing works, they're gonna do it that way. If spear phishing works, they're gonna do it that way. And they're ever evolving, because as you clamp down on one area, they're gonna to shift to a new area. So ransomware was the big one that, uh, that came out, and uh, who here has been hit by ransomware? Anybody? Okay, so I've helped people who have been hit by ransomware, but haven't personally been hit. Um, I used to give talks and people would say, well, it's not gonna happen on a personal device. And I'm like, why? Would a, cri would a criminal, um, not take a personal credit card, but take a business credit card? No, it's about the money. So it doesn't matter where it is, it matters if they can get the money and how easily, all right? Um, I wanna talk about this increase in electricity usage. Uh, who here is, is fairly familiar with, or who has any cryptocurrencies in the room? Who here owns cryptocurrencies? Raise your hand. A couple people, okay. so. Huge phenomenon that's part of this, this wave that is changing our environment. And what's different about it is that it's based on blockchain, right? And blockchain is pieces of information that are stacked upon each other that then are verified by other computers. So what does that do to our computer usage? Goes up. It goes through the roof, right? So crypto mining is all those computers logging and putting together those blocks of information. So if you don't know about this, if this isn't part of what you read, Google it, search it. This is part of the wave of the future. Now, it was interesting to me because I, um, working on some blockchain uh, entrepreneurial things and, and some, and I ran into new people on my, in my building. So I have a certain suite with you know, offices, and then on the other end, somebody had moved out, and there were quite a few uh, offices open. And I said, so, so who's moving in? And I discovered I have crypto miners that moved in down the hall from me. Isn't that ironic? I do cybersecurity and crypto miners moved in. So I said, great. So I go off and I, I chat with them and we go to lunch occasionally. And one of the reasons that they are specifically in my neck of the woods is because I am from Spokane, Washington. That's where our headquarters are. What's unique about Spokane, Washington? Say it louder. Cheap power. Okay. How much do you pay for your power per kilowatt? Do you know? You all run computers, you all have a house. How much do you pay for your kilowatt? Too much, I like it, I like it. Okay, um, so in Spokane, uh, we pay 5.6 cents per kilowatt. So that's about 
40 to 50% lower than the national average. So the highest rates are in South Carolina. Now that's the whole state, maybe different regions are lower, but the West tends to have lower power. So Utah, Colorado, Washington, right? We are around a lot of dams and hydro, and so we have very low power. So guess who's moving in everywhere? Crypto miners. I've got crypto miners literally down the hall from me. This is the wave of the future, okay? Now, going back to the ransomware, it's all inter interwoven because now, um, we see a, a slight decrease in ransomware in the beginning of 2018. Why? Because those bad actors have discovered it's easier to get passwords or get into crypto mining or to get somebody's cryptocurrency password than it is to do this. And so they're shifting. Will it shift back? I bet it will by the end of the year. It's going to shift back. But right now, it's the hottest thing. So stay with what works. Ransomware attacks grew threefold in 2017. Now I just mentioned that in the beginning of 2018 they dipped. But it's because what's easiest, right? What's easiest? Undetected. If they stay undetected longer, that's easier, right? Most traditional uh, anti-malware tools rely on a signature file to detect and block the threats. What's going to be easiest? So when you're thinking about your strategy for cybersecurity, you have to put on that mental hat of, if I were a bad guy, how would I do this? Right? You have to say, if I was trying to get into this system, what's my weakest point? And when you can, you can put that hat on, then all of a sudden you can see the places you need to work on. There are um, trainings where we put people through and basically red team, blue team, uh, go after and say, where are the vulnerabilities? Where are the holes? That's what that hat you have to put on. Okay, how has phishing evolved? Who in this room um, helps run a phishing uh, or is an HR or security and, and helps run anything with phishing in their organization? Raise your hand. Okay, so phishing is evolving. Where was it before? Went after the individual. And it still does, but the latest trends are phishing is going after the whole organization. Okay, not Petya uh, favored this method, right? So because it will look at settings that you have set up, and it will be able to go in the back door. Attackers are increasingly evading detection by living off the land. What is living off the land? Who knows what that means? Go ahead, say it loud. Isn't that scary? Did you hear him? He said, using a existing tools basically to attack you, right? So I, can, I think it's very scary. But if I had a black hat on, I would look around and say, you know what? This is the easiest way in. I know how they're going to configure it, so I'm just going to use it against them. PowerShell, Windows, uh, Credentials Editor, all of these are part of that. Okay, so how many in this room use one of these platforms? Raise your hand higher, higher. Okay, realize that that is where the attack vectors are shifting. Okay, more regulations. Regulations are a huge part of what's shifting and changing. Now, I speak about GDPR. Uh, does everybody here, raise your hand, you know what GDPR is? General data, right? Okay, so it has a lot of media play because May 25th, it became the, it became the, the most recent but also the most stringent 
data protection policy in the world. Now, Australia might debate with me on that and some other people, but for 28 nations, for 512 million people, it became the de facto, okay? So what's different about this? The EU has determined that they feel a digital footprint of a person is a right for privacy. So Thomas here sitting on the front row, his information, if he's from France or if he is from Germany or any other EU country, it is his information, which means he has rights to that information, rights to be forgotten or rights to be, uh, to, ha to know what they're doing with it, to know if they're selling it to a third party. I've often hated signing up, putting my email address. How many of you have a fake email address just so you don't have it? Okay, you have to, right? Because if you give them your real email address, it ends up on who knows where, and you didn't give them permission to give it to that third party who sold it to the next pers person, and all of a sudden you get all this junk, right? That's the whole issue, right? That's the issue. Do you have control and should you have the right to privacy of your own data? The EU has come out and said, yes, we believe you do. Now, the US right now is still kind of behind the scenes on that. They don't, we don't have it any place that it's a right. We have a, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? But not to the privacy of our data. Now, will that change? Maybe. But this is not a debate about GDPR. This is about looking at what the future is bringing. And the future is bringing a tidal wave. And part of that tidal wave is regulation. Because everybody said, how come I have to have a second and third email just so I don't get junk email? How come? Right? Well, the reason is because we don't have good laws or, or we haven't really, it hasn't caught up to it, right? We're evolving in IT and as a, as a nation and as a world faster than people can regulate it. Well, regulation's coming. So as you see, as you see this coming, it is, it is, um, it is here. So the GDPR went into effect May 25th. Already there are a fines going or are they're starting the process. Now, I had a conversation with somebody at lunch about the GDPR. And what did we discuss? It's really about how to change behavior. They're not trying to say, hey, you, Google or, or Facebook, who's here, uh, or, or anybody else, we want to go after you. What they really want to do is change people's behavior. And what do they want? They want to have people protect data, good data protection, good stewards. That's what I like to say. I like to say good stewards. Are you, are you maintaining your stewardship of my data? Can I trust you? Prove it to me. And the way you prove it to me is be transparent. Let me choose. If I need to break off our relationship, let me do that. And that you then don't sell my information to more people, right? It's transparency and data protection. It is going to revolutionize and change marketing, right? What does marketing do right now? Behavior, spam. But they know everything. They know that I searched up, um, you know, going to Hawaii. So now I get all, all these ads for Hawaii, right? They know that I searched this. Like, marketing is going to change. So how is it really, how, how are they going to do that? How are they going to stratify that? That's the new wave of regulation. And people are arguing about it. And I'm not here to tell you it is right or wrong, it's good or bad. What I'm here to tell you is, it is here. Get your head out of the sand, because it is coming. You can be influential in it, and you can help your organizations understand it better. But it is not going away. It is here. 
So more accountability for both public and private sectors. For some people, is this scary? Okay, raise your hand if you think the GDPR is scary. Okay, it's kind of scary if you understand it. Now, I know a little bit, I know too much about the GDPR. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I mean, it's, I mean, the documentation side, you got to have all these documents, you got to, I mean, you think HIPAA is bad. Okay, GDPR documentation is way worse, okay? It is like way more in depth. And you kind of have to know all these legal terms and, and it's a bear, but it's here. We're not discussing it like, oh, maybe in the future, right? No, 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 it's here. Get your head out of the sand. Now, what, what is the US doing about this? Well, right now, we're scrambling and trying to figure out our own identity on these issues. So you look at uh, New York. New York recently passed um, the NYDFS. So the New York Department of Financial Services in February 16th of 2017 passed more stringent regulations for anybody that is in insurance, banking, loaning money, uh, you know, all these areas, anything with financial, right, that hits through New York. Well, how many companies are in financial that don't have something in New York? I mean, really, right? So formal risk-based cybersecurity programs. They, it is a 14-point cybersecurity policy that is mandated seven-point incident response plan that is mandated in the regulation, okay? 72-hour um, notice in the regulation. So there's crossovers between this and the GDPR. Are they the same? No. Are they both trying to think about how to regulate and properly address issues? Yes. This is what New York has tried to do. Okay. California, who's familiar with the AB 375? Okay, we've got some people who do know what it is, okay? This happened about the same time that the GDPR was going through, but the GDPR got all the press coverage, right? Instead, this is about inalienable rights of privacy for Californians. Now, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. It used to be sixth. It's overtaken Britain again. And so it is now the fifth. So some people say as California goes, so does the rest of the nation, right? Mainly because auto manufacturers, other people, if it has to be compliant to California, it's kind of a de facto, right? So California passed this and it has some crossover to GDPR, but very different in other ways. It passed through the legislature, but it has not been ratified by California residents. There is a 18-month window. It is not going into effect until January 1 of 2020. And they are already trying to clarify ambiguity. Because that's the problem, right? As an IT professional, you're like, well, what does this mean? How do I actually incorporate this? Because I can't tell what some, somebody in you know, Washington or somebody in uh, Sacramento made this ghibli gook. Well, what does it really mean? So they're trying to clarify it and, and understand it. Hopefully, it'll get better and not worse, right? But they're doing a huge attempt. Now, I put up here one of the things that's really different. So it allows consumers to sue companies for unauthorized access as a result of the business violation. All right, this is a big shift in regulation. So what this California regulation will do is, let's say I have a company in California, and I make pacemakers. And for some reason, I didn't do my job, and I didn't hire the right people, and I didn't have my security plan in place, and I was very negligent. If I get breached, then those consumers can actually sue me. This is where IT is going to cross over into legal. Okay? Now, this is, this is kind of precedent area. 
and it's somewhere between 100 up to 750. And here's the catch, without having to prove they have been harmed by the data breach. So you can probably easily say a heart monitor, right, or a heart pacemaker, oh, I've, I've been harmed. But if you don't have to prove that you've been harmed, that's a whole different ballgame. It just has, you have to prove you've been breached. All right, so the Joneses, trying to keep up with the Joneses. It is a hard job. You look at the person next to you and go, oh my gosh, do, are you doing that? Are you set? Are you set, right? You need resources, training. Don't have this mentality. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. All you have to do is keep up with you and your organization. Because wherever you're at, you can become stronger. That's actually the name of my company. Because some people we talk to, they're way down here. They have no policies. They have no infrastructure. Like, they're way down here. We help them move up one level, right? Then you have people who are way up here. They've got their 72 incident response plan. Like, they test it. Like, you're like, wow, they're rock stars. They have all of this together. Well, they might be up here, but you know what? They can improve, too. Because maybe they don't know anything about the GDPR, and all of a sudden, they have to be compliant. So everybody has a place to move. Do not feel like you have to keep up with the Joneses. Take inventory of where you are and move from there. So how do you stay current? Expert training, right? Because what you learned in school has already changed, right? Connecting to community. That's one of the reasons that you're here at this conference. You want to be able to say, hey, I was there. I was learning. I was connecting with people. Connect online. Executive leadership. Make sure your executive team understands the problems. Don't speak Wookiee, right? Don't speak Wookiee. Make sure they get it. Spend time making sure they get it. Use an intermediary. Use somebody who doesn't speak Wookiee to help interpret. Okay. I know that you can do it and become stronger. And if you realize this wave that's coming, you're better able to not stress about it and be able to plan what you're going to do about it. And I will take questions now. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead. So that's a good question. If you didn't hear it, is the trend with the GDPR, um, is it going to more privacy uh, officers and privacy, not just security? And are they separate, right? Are they separate? And they, they need to be. So I actually had this conversation over lunch where can you have the main security person also be the compliance officer? Well, you can't. Uh, ideally, some people might to begin with, but no, they have to be separate. And we haven't had a lot of conversation about privacy. And in your world as security people, no matter what your job role is, privacy is now going to be talked about more so than it ever has been. Ten years ago, did we talk about privacy? We're like, oh my gosh, we got all their emails. Man, we can send junk to them. Right? I mean, we didn't talk about privacy, but we do now. And yes, they are separate roles. So thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you very much.